What's up guys, thanks for stopping by, I hope you're doing good. Today I'm excited to share with you a new Valheim challenge video. This one is very special because I can say for sure that no one has ever done this before and I'm pretty sure no one will ever do this after watching this video because this challenge is wild. First of all, I just want to do a quick thank you for the reception of the Valheim in reverse video. It's been absolutely mind-blowing and I appreciate all you guys so much that have subbed to the channel and left all amazing messages about the video. It was so crazy what happened with that video. Seeing articles about it in games media all over the internet, being sent messages from people that saw it. It's the best experience I've ever had as a content creator so far, so thanks so much. But this challenge video this one makes valheim in reverse look like absolutely nothing so welcome everybody to the valheim vegan challenge before we jump into the details i just want to let all you guys know if you question whether i actually really did anything in this video there is a link in the description to a playlist of all of the recording sessions this challenge took me 50 plus hours on 15 different sessions of recording all of which were broadcast live on youtube and twitch so if you don't believe anything in this video or or you want to see the entire process of how I figured it out, you can click the link in the description and watch the whole archive for yourself. So just like my previous challenge videos, I'm going to outline the rules and the key challenges. But before that, I want to explain why the Vegan Valheim challenge, because it sounds kind of dumb, right? Wrong. That's what I thought at first. Since I started making challenges and speedruns, I have had a ton of suggestions about what challenge video to do next. After posting Valheim in reverse, and after that project took so long i wanted to make a shorter challenge that was focused more on gameplay and that's why i did the challenge to beat all of the bosses using a flint knife because that focused more on gameplay but there's something unique about valheim in reverse that appealed to me in the first place because it involved showing a lot of weird mechanics to the game that i knew most people wouldn't know about and i felt that actually could make the video more interesting so when people were making suggestions i'd just be streaming playing valheim normally or doing speedruns and sometimes Sometimes people regularly make jokes in the Valheim community about having a vegetarian or a vegan character because obviously you can eat food in the game and there's plenty of fruits and vegetables that your character can eat. So this kind of started a bit of a joke where sometimes people would just think they were being funny um, by suggesting a vegan challenge. And I know that they were just thinking about food restrictions. But when I actually started to think about it, vegans in real life don't just restrict what they eat. They restrict all different kinds of things that they use in their life that come from animals. And that's when I started to think this challenge could actually be insane because even not using hide alone or leather, that instantly means you basically can't have any armor, you can't make most weapons, and you couldn't make boats. And it was when I realized that you wouldn't be able to make boats huh? that I felt that we could be onto something. Because there are several ways in this game you can travel across the ocean without them. And making a challenge video that involves that would require showing off some cool mechanics just like Valheim in reverse. And that's just with that one restriction. So that is ultimately why I chose to make this video. It's time to explain the rules. This challenge has nothing to do with any kind of vegan ideology. It's a video game. We're here to have fun. And our mission is to defeat all the bosses whilst not eating any food that contains materials dropped by an animal. We're not allowed to craft any item or structure that requires materials dropped by an animal, especially if the material is supposed to be a body part or hide. Within this rule, I decided to include Grey Dwarfs because this means that we can't use Grey Dwarf eyes to make portals, which I think makes for a much more interesting challenge. Drakes, because ice cream requires a freeze gland, which is obviously a body part. And golems, because golems are people too, guys. <laughs> So no crystal battle axe. We're also not allowing mead because technically vegans don't eat honey. And this also makes the challenge much more interesting and difficult. And just as a reminder of the above rules, this means that we definitely can't make boats. We can't make bows. We can't make arrows. We can't make most weapons in the game. And we can't use portals. I also will try to use the least cheesy strats possible when doing the bosses because there are many different speedrun strats to get around things in this game. But I think it 
would be interesting if I tried to use as few of them as possible. But sometimes we may have to choose things for it even to be possible because of the food restrictions, the lack of armor, the lack of meads, and the extremely low DPS we'll be doing. So what are the key challenges? So the key challenges will be figuring out the best strat for every boss, except for the first boss, because that's the only one that we'll basically be doing normally. But for all the others, we're going to be at a huge disadvantage because we're going to be greatly under geared and we're going to have low health. Modder in particular is going to be tricky because we won't be able to use a bow. So we need to figure out how we're going to do it with melee. Getting a pickaxe will also be a challenge because I'm not going to be using the antler pick. Managing our spawn will also be a key challenge. Because we have no portals, we're going to have to rely on setting our spawn by placing beds down all the time. So if we don't do this correctly and our bed gets destroyed, we're going to be sent all the way back to the middle. Inventory management is also going to be a huge issue. Because we can't portal, we won't be able to just build a base where we store everything. So most of the time, we'll only have access to resources we can actually carry. Surviving the mountain is also going to be very difficult because there's no capes that we can actually make within the rule set and also no meat. So this means no cold resistance. So we're basically going to have to figure out how to survive in the mountain whilst freezing to death. Traversing the ocean is a really obvious one because we're not going to be able to have boats. So we need to figure out a strat to cross the ocean. And also, if our bed does get destroyed, we're going to be traversing the ocean all over again. Our food is also incredibly restricted. So figuring out our most feasible food options is going to be very important. And last but not least is weapons. Weapons are basically the most restricted thing in this challenge except for armor so we're going to have to figure out the best way to use the small amount of weapons we're going to have at our disposal Right, so jumping into the challenge, our first deer with a trophy died in a little accident we had with a campfire that I had absolutely nothing to do with, guys. Our second was actually attacked by bees and we were able to salvage the trophy after the fact. Then I made a little base at the actual eek deer spawn so that if I died, I wouldn't have far to travel to respawn. And then at the workstation, I built a flint axe. Now it's time for our first boss fight. This one isn't anything too crazy because we're actually doing this one quite normally. I focused on placing a lot of camp fires to set each there on fire I was also hitting with torches and melee weapons to do the rest of the damage Next, before fighting the Elder, I kited a troll to a bronze vein and a tin node. And instead of using the antler pick, got the troll to do the work for me by aggroing him and getting him to attack, then dodging the attack. So he ends up mining the mats we need to make our bronze pick. Collecting the cores necessary to make the smelter was also a little bit of a challenge. A strategy here was to actually build a bed on the top of a burial chamber so no mobs could reach me up there. And so I could respawn directly outside the dungeon if I died, as well as placing campfires inside side burial chambers to get a free sheltered rest for the actual rested bonus and using these strats after a little trial and error i was able to get the five cores we needed to make a smelter and that is how we got our first pickaxe now with the bronze pickaxe I mine the necessary mats for a copper knife. The copper knife is one of the only weapons that we can actually make in this challenge because it doesn't require anything from any animal mobs. And although the damage stats are actually quite low themselves, this weapon is better than it looks because the attack speed of the knife is actually higher than most weapons, which results in it doing more DPS than some weapons 
with similar stats. One other interesting strat I actually used inside burial chambers was manipulating skeletons using doors. Whenever there was multiple skeletons behind a door, I would open and close the door, making sure to just let one skeleton out at a time, making it easier to clear the dungeon and get the loot that we're looking for. It was also at this point in the playthrough where we start working on our first farm, collected the three ancient seeds we needed, and eventually, out of sheer luck, we stumbled across the Elder Spawn. It's my lucky day. Fighting the Elder itself was no joke, but it mostly just required a lot of timing, a lot of well-placed dodges, and a lot of patience. My ultimate strat during this boss fight was actually to stay as close to the Elder as possible. This is partly due to the fact that we don't have any ranged attacks because we can't use bows, but it's also because the Elder's most dangerous attack is his ranged vine attack. So as long as you stay close to him, you won't actually do that. Then, every time he does his stomp attack, by using a well-placed dodge roll and rolling directly into him, we're able to avoid damage and stay right in front of him and do as many melee attacks as possible before he does his next attack. Then, whenever he summons the vines out of the ground, we usually just run away and hide behind a pillar until they despawn, as the pillar will protect us from the Elder's ranged attacks. And if we have to, we can also try and attack the vines, because they are very low on health and you can destroy them. Once the vines are cleared, we go back up close and personal with the Elder, and we rinse and repeat this process over and over again until he's eventually defeated, whilst making sure we have a bed down close by so we can easily respawn and get back into the action. Because a new traveling across oceans was going to be difficult, one of the key parts of this challenge was actually to fully explore basically every island that we got to, at least until we'd located all of the bosses. And eventually, by exploring our starting island extensively, I was able to find a couple of mountains, one of which ended up having the modder rune on. This was extremely lucky because navigating the ocean without a boat and not knowing what direction we should be going in would have been a huge problem. So it was great that we were able to know which direction we need to travel in once we are ready to leave the island. We scaled the mountain and activated the rune by leaving tombstones along the route to the structure that would enable us to use corpse run to avoid dying from freezing. Corpse run is a buff that activates once you empty out a tombstone and it allows your character to regen health for the duration that the buff is active. Before leaving this island to fight modder, I wanted to be as prepared as possible. This meant doing lots and lots of farming. We planted as many carrots as possible to allow us to make as much carrot soup as possible and he also collected as many berries as I could to make as much jam as possible. I even checked some more mountains to find onion seeds which was its own challenge because surviving in the mountains was never easy during this playthrough. Once I got a few onion seeds I just multiplied the onions over and over until I had enough to make a lot of onion soup and now with a combination of onion soup, jam and carrot soup I didn't necessarily have amazing food but I basically had one of the best food combinations available to me within the rule set. However, onion soup did require a spice rack to level up my cauldron, and spice racks require turnips, and finding turnip seeds proved to be one of the most difficult things in this challenge. But to explain that, I first have to explain how we're going to be crossing the oceans. Here it is, the cart, the answer to all of our problems regarding the ocean. In order to cross the ocean without using any mats from animals, I would instead be traveling the ocean by cart. Carts float just below the surface of the ocean but they float high enough in the water that your character is actually not fully submerged and therefore able to walk without consuming any stamina. Walking forwards while standing in the back of a cart in the ocean will also push the cart in the direction that you're walking. This combined with the fact that we're not consuming any stamina basically allows us to infinitely walk on water. This is relatively simple to pull off however you have to keep an eye on your viking's feet because if at any time your feet have 
happen to slip out of the cart, you will fall out of the back and lose control and all of a sudden be forced to swim where you will be draining stamina and eventually drown if you keep moving. Whilst doing this, you also have to always keep an eye out for waves because any big waves will briefly push the cart down underwater and if you keep swimming, you will also end up swimming out of the back of the cart and the only way really to end up back in the cart whilst in the open ocean is to wait for a wave to come along to push it back down. So basically, ideally, when doing this, you never want to leave the cart when you're in the open ocean. You always want to keep moving and you don't want to make any mistakes because you'll either drown or be forced to wait for a big wave. So back to the story I was telling earlier. <laughs> Using this strat, I decided to travel to a nearby swamp to explore for turnip seeds. This is how I learned that approaching swamps from the ocean was not a good idea in this challenge as leeches all of a sudden become the most deadly creature in the game. This caused me to lose my swamp key on this tiny swamp island that I kept having to try to get back to to recover my gear and eventually I just ended up carting across and placing a bed down to have a spawn there. Then I tried over and over and over and over again to try and recover my items from an island infested with mobs that I had no gear to fight. This resulted in me dying an insane amount of times. The way I was eventually able to get out of this situation was by another speedrun strat that will now explain. Basically, when you log out in Valheim, your stamina is instantly restored. So if you log out and then instantly log back in, your character will have full stamina. Most of you probably know this from playing the game normally. You just may not have tried to apply it during a gameplay scenario. But something else that happens when you log out, which is less obvious, is that enemies that aren't looking at you basically get de-aggroed. So by running across this small island and periodically logging off and logging back on again plus a few well-placed dodges i was able to eventually recover my gear but even using any little tricks that i knew from speedrunning this was still incredibly challenging and took a very long period of time and i died many many times so no part of this situation was easy after returning back to the starting island i did eventually find a swamp that i was able to get to via land and it's here that i managed to find the turnip seeds necessary to grow turnips and that is how i made the spice which enabled me to make onion soup to stock up for our modifier. Once all the preparation was done, I filled my inventory with all of the essential things we needed to progress, plus as much good food as possible. Then I used my cart, affectionately named the long cart by chat, to travel all the way across the ocean towards the modern marker for our next boss fight. And I know what you're thinking, what about serpents? Well, I had no strategy for dealing with serpents. <laughs> So we walked all the way across the ocean using the long car, praying, just praying we never found a serpent. And yep, we made it. No serpents. Once we hit dry land, I made sure I made a little base and got a bed down and started planning my next move. Using a combination of my best food plus relogs, I was able to get almost all the way to the modder spawn and die and therefore place a tombstone near modder at the top of the mountain. Then after a short journey with no items except just for one random thing that would allow me to place a tombstone, using relogs, I got a short way up the lower part of the mountain, which allowed me to place a closer tombstone then on the third run up the mountain using my best food and a combination of both tombstones along the way i was able to make it all the way to the modder spawn this proved to be an awesome strat to deal with the mountain that i was super happy with and i may even utilize this in future speed runs but it did not go completely smoothly i did have to redo this a couple of times and it was still very challenging this next part was another key aspect of the challenge by digging down at the base of the modder the altar you're able to reveal a sort of rim underneath the altar digging under this forms a little bit of a roof and if you dig out a whole circle or just a semicircle underneath the modder platform you end up with this roof that provides you with enough shelter to put a bed down and sleep that is also indestructible from any mobs attacks and having this hidden spawn underneath the modder altar is a huge reason why this boss fight was actually possible once we had a base of operations underneath the modder altar and 
now started running out and exploring the mountain looking for dragon eggs. During this time, I simply just YOLO'd and if I died, I died and just respawned at the modder altar and just ran in a different direction. But lucky for us, there were three eggs quite close by. Just a little tip for anyone that plays the game normally, this is actually usually the case. I get asked about this all the time on speedruns, but literally more than 90% of the time, there's almost always three eggs on any mountain that contains modder. Sometimes you can get unlucky and there isn't enough eggs. But I just wanted to explain for the purpose of this video that whilst that might seem crazy to some, it is actually the norm that we found three eggs this way. So with our three eggs, we're now ready to fight modder. So I will now explain the strat for fighting modder. I first want to start off by saying this was not easy. It took many attempts, many, many deaths and a very long time to actually do this. And gameplay wise, it was one of the more challenging aspects of the challenge. Challenge. So first of all, I was going to be fighting Modder with the copper knife. This means that we're not trying to fight her when she's in the air. So the plan when Modder does a projectile attack is simply just to dodge the attack. You can pretty much do this just by full sprinting in one direction. Then when Modder landed, I got in as many attacks as possible. And every time she did a melee attack, I had to make sure that my dodge roll was perfect and make sure I didn't take any damage. Then after a series of attacks, I would go back into our hidden underground base and rest by a fire in the shelter. Whilst resting at this fire, we recover HP way faster and eventually we get our rested bonus, which causes us to also restore stamina faster. Once our health had regened and we have the rested buff, I would jump out of the hole, ideally waiting for modder to have already landed, which a lot of the time was actually the case, or for the times that it wasn't the case, just dodging her projectile attacks until she lands again, getting in as many attacks in again as we could until we didn't have the stamina or the health to continue, and then going back in the hole to our underground base and rinsing and repeating the strategy over and over and over again making sure that we never waited too long between attacks so that modder didn't have enough time to regen health like i said this was very difficult it took a lot of attempts and even when i got the strategy down and nailed it absolutely perfectly with very few mistakes it took a total of 90 minutes for modder to go from having full HP to zero HP. Oh, and by the way, whilst trying to set up this underground base, my bed was actually destroyed and then I was killed by a drake, which sent me all the way back to the center of the map. And I had to use the long cart to traverse the ocean all over again. After defeating Modder, I was all out of decent food, so I decided to set up another farm on the island where we fought Modder. Before leaving the starting island, I made sure I brought at least one carrot, one onion, and one turnip to make sure I'd be able to replant these and turn them into seeds and restart our farming project all over again. So this is what we did. I refarmed all the carrots and all the onions and remade a spice rack and collected enough berries to make more jam in order to restock a decent 
decent food supply within the rule set of the challenge all over again. And this did actually take a while. Lucky for us, right next to the farm was a swamp. And inside this swamp, I found a crypt. And while exploring this crypt, I was able to find the withered bones that we need to summon bone mass. And also, we were lucky enough to find a bone mass rune inside this very crypt. This, again, was a huge blessing for this challenge because it gave us another direction for our next ocean voyage so that we weren't just traveling blindly. So we then set sail using our not so trusty long cart in the general direction of bone mass and eventually once we hit dry land we immediately put down a bed and set our spawn. This is where we begin the setup for the bone mass fight. In order to use a similar strat that we did for modder where it proved incredibly useful to have a spawn at the boss altar I used some core wood poles to build a little shack floating above the skull that we could use to place our bed. You can build on top of other structures inside the swamp, even on top of the skull directly, but sometimes bone mass's melee attacks still reach the structures and destroy them, which would be tragic for us in this challenge. So by using the core wood and elevating the bed and reducing that surface area in bone mass's immediate vicinity, we we're able to place a bed somewhere where it could evade destruction. My plan for countering bone mass's poison attack was to leave tons of tombstones that would allow me to regen health. Without poison resistance or armor, however, Corpse Run is not as useful as you would think, as she still barely regen health and was still basically always one shot from Bone Mass no matter what. So the basic strap for this boss fight was to get up close and personal with Bone Mass and using the wooden club, which was basically the only weapon that we could actually craft that did blunt damage and of course Bone Mass is weak to blunt. Using the wooden club, we did as much damage as we could and every time we did a melee attack, we would dodge it and we would try and always make sure that we had a corpse run buff when he uses his poison attack but even if we didn't we still just focus on doing as much damage as possible because wasting too much time not dealing damage meant that bone masses health regen would cause him to out heal us due to the low dps we we're actually doing basically anytime there was a skeleton i would run up to it and destroy it because any attacks from arrows or melee again would cause us to die right away this also took a very long time and many attempts in fact it almost took as long to get bone mass from max health to zero as it took for us to get modder from max health to zero This is where the exploration gets much more difficult. In order to find Yag's location, we had to traverse across the ocean to new islands a couple of times in order to find a plains biome with the Yag rune inside it. We did still get very lucky with this as we only had to travel across a few oceans, but this was a huge risk. Eventually though, we did find the Yag rune, which gave us a direction to go in 
for our final boss fight. Whilst looking for Yag, I also explored as many fueling villages and towers as possible, looking for totems. Generally, whenever I found a village with a totem in it or a tower, I placed a bed down nearby and left all of my valuable items behind. And I would just sprint inside the village, grab the totem and run away until they either stopped following me or re-log to de-aggro the mobs. I did this over and over again until I had enough totems to summon your glove. This is where things might get a little familiar for anyone that has seen my previous videos. The strat that I used to fight your glove is a pretty cheesy speedrun strat that has been made a little bit more difficult than it was before when I did Valheim in reverse, but it's still the best way to do it within this challenge rule set. I did experiment with multiple ways of fighting Yag without doing this, but because fire damage now stacks, because we weren't making meads, because there was no armor we could make, and because the damage you take from fire is actually relative to your armor value as well, and because our outgoing damage was so low, there was simply no strategy I could find within the rule set to actually fight and kill your glove successfully, where he wouldn't just out regen our attacks. So to my knowledge, within this rule set, this is the only way you can kill your glove. I know what some of you might be thinking, Nick, just make padded armor, that just requires linen. Well, the catch with padded armor and black metal is that the spinning wheel actually requires leather. So even though it doesn't directly require leather or hide to make padded armor or black metal weapons, we still can't use them within this challenge because a spinning wheel requires leather and that is necessary to turn flax into linen. So what we do is we dig a hole nearby the Yag altar, making sure that we have a workbench inside with a roof to repair our wood and flint items. Then we build a roof using floor tiles, leaving a little hole to jump in and out. Then once your glove is summoned, before he spawns, we quickly run and jump into the hole and seal it above us. When working correctly, your glove will be kited over to your wood platform and his stomach will clip through the floor, allowing you to do damage. And because he can't see you, he won't aggro. This takes a very long time because we're using weapons that do very low damage. But because of the workbench, we can infinitely repair them, which means we are able to deal in enough damage so that it doesn't out regen us and with enough time and patience you can defeat your glove however the recent ai changes to the game have made this more difficult to be clear the developers haven't actually fixed this it's just sometimes now your glove ai will either cause him to get stuck on a rock or something or if you have a little bit of wood or roof sticking out of your wood platform it might cause yag to now aggro and destroy your whole setup this actually happened to me during this challenge and it was actually a huge problem and made this much more difficult and the way I counted this was after the first setup failed, I built another hole at the opposite side of the island. And I would run away from Yag and start trying to build the setup in one hole. And as he was gradually kited over to me, if I ran out of time to finish the setup in that hole, I would run back to the other hole and kite him all the way back there. And I just repeated this process over and over again until I was able to complete at least one of the setups. And eventually I did. This also took a very long time. <laughs> Even with this strat which does make things very safe for us during the boss fight once it's working it still took approximately 30 minutes of almost constantly attacking yak to get his hp from full health to zero And that's it. That is this monumental challenge completed. I want to do a huge thank you to anyone who's staying to the end of this video and a huge shout out to the community that supports me on Patreon or with donations and stuff. I wouldn't have been able to do this without my community support. And I feel like it's worth mentioning. This is the biggest video project I've ever undertaken. As of the time of recording this voiceover, it has taken more than two weeks to actually do the gameplay challenge several days prior of planning. And it is 
now taken almost three weeks to make this video with all of the editing and special effects and voiceover work. I really wanted this to be the best video I ever made. So thank you to anyone that supports because this has really been a tough one. And hopefully with the support of my community, I'll be able to make more videos like this in the future. All right, guys, that's just about going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and a nice positive comment and subscribe for future content. I do stream challenges and speedruns live on this very YouTube channel and live on Twitch. So I'll leave a link in the description to my Twitch as well if you're interested in that. If you would like to support the content financially and help keep it a reality, then you can pledge on Patreon at patreon.com slash nickrawcliffe where you'll get access to a private server just for patrons. You can also do donations, so I'll leave a link in the description to that as well. You can follow me on social media at the links below. And until next time, have a good one.